Thank you for the invitation again. It's always uh, a pleasure for me to come and speak, especially to a history-related group. I have the pleasure or displeasure of speaking to a lot of groups that when I look out in the audience, all I see are eyelids because they're not a history-related group whatsoever. And they all know that when I come to talk, it's going to be a talk about history. So I have to really be careful in those groups because, uh, again, the snoring can get very, very loud. <laughs> but to a history group, it's, it's always fun because we're of uh, kindred spirits. And so that's the way I view it here this evening. Uh, I spend... I. For some reason, I calculated it the other day, but um, I've been doing Tulare County research for over 30 years now, and I, I tend to fall into the category of focusing on the, the ne'er-do-wells of society. <laughs> uh, I love the outlaws, especially in our early history. I really have a fascination with that part of our history. And so I guess that's one of the reasons that drew me into this particular topic that I'm going to talk to you about this evening. And that's Joseph James D'Angelo, the Visalia Rancic. Rarely do I have a spot in the history that I research. Usually it was back in the 1800s and I was not even a twinkle in anybody's eye in the 1800s. Um, but I love the outlaws and I love the, the bad men of our past and I like the, the cops that kind of tried to keep them in line as well. Well, this case, I actually was with the Visalia Police Department at the time that Joseph D'Angelo, the ransacker, was doing his capers in, in Visalia. Uh, I'd been with the department about two years when he started to do his crime spree and uh, got involved in this case to a very minor extent. Uh, but again, it was kind of a different thing for me to look into the historical story and have me be in it. That was kind of an unusual experience for me, but it was fun at the same time. And let me give you a little idea here. Now, I would, I would surmise that the hunt for the Visalia Ransacker was probably the biggest, if not the biggest, one of the biggest manhunts in Tulare County history. Now we've had some man hunts. Believe me, we had Evans and Sontag that were on, we were hunting them for a long time. And we couldn't catch them either for a long time. Then of course there was the Weeby kidnapping. Some of you old timers may remember uh, in the early 19, probably 1970 actually, when Michelle Weeby was uh, kidnapped from Visalia and of course the the hunt went on for her kidnappers for that as well. So we've had some big cases, but I argue none have been bigger than the hunt for the Visalia Ransom. And for those of you that may not have been here or remember some of the detail, and I wasn't here for Tim's uh, presentation, so he may this may be old news to you, but I'm going to kind of summarize what I saw from the inside going on. And, and I was uh, a uniformed officer at the times, and I actually uh, took some of the burglary reports that, uh, that uh, the ransacker committed. So I can kind of speak a little bit from the inside, and I went on a lot of the, a number of the stakeouts to try and catch this guy. And I made some arrests of people after the case that had nothing to do with the ransacker, but because that case was so big and it terrorized the community so badly that I arrested this public drunk at COS shortly after some of the, the ransacking crimes. And as I was 
escorting this intoxicated person to my patrol car, people would say, is that the ransacker? And I go, my gosh, ransacker is on everybody's mind. I mean, it was that big a deal. And people were really terrorized. And again, no matter what happened, they tried to connect it to this serial criminal. And so let me give you a little bit of a synopsis of what was going on from the ransacker's side of it. Um, he was called the ransacker, and he was named that by our department, the Visalia Ransacker, because his primary MO or method of operation was to burglarize a home and uproot the entire residence, tip over drawers from cabinets and do all the things that you'd expect with ransack. And so he, he was quickly tagged with the Visalia ransack. Well, if you commit one burglary, there are no patterns to follow. But if you commit three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, with similar MO, similar method of operation, if you're a good agency or a good cop, you say, wait a minute, this is the same person committing those crimes. They're doing the same exact thing each time. And so what was he doing? Well, he was ransacking. But he would go into the little children's piggy banks and take some of the coins out, leave the rest of them there. He would go to the kitchen and dishes and take the dishes and put some right in the middle of the hallway. All at once you go, this is not your typical burglar here. This is somebody that's either antagonizing or doing something to challenge you. He committed about 100 of those. And we, of course, identified that fairly quickly, that it was the same guy. And he also did a number of prowlings, peeping Tom kind of things. And rarely do you do reports on those unless there's real evidence that somebody was actually standing at the window, you see footprints, or you've got some credible evidence to believe that there was really a peeping Tom there. I mean, people say, I heard somebody at the window. Well, it could be a cat, it could be a dog. You go to the window, there's no footprints in the, in the, in the dirt. So you start to wonder, was it really a prowler? So you don't take a report on a lot of prowling calls. And so those weren't as easy to track. But we later learned that many of the prowling calls were the ransacker at the same time. Not necessarily doing burglaries either, but peeping in windows and, and looking at, at things going on inside the home. So that was, that was an MO thing that was going on with the ransacker. And the ransacker do other things. Um, would uh, take undergarments, especially women's undergarments, and would drape them over a sofa and set them on a chair. And all at once, your keen police mind sprang into action. You said, wait a minute. There's something weird about this particular case. That's not your typical burglar who's trying to steal something to sell it to make some money to buy drugs. That's not, that's not this person. Uh, guns would be taken. Um, jewelry would be taken. One earring, sometimes. One earring would be taken. Eventually, we concluded that was sort of a trophy kind of thing, that this person was somehow um, excited about this would take that one earring with him when we, he left. And so all at once, things started to get really strange. And you started to wonder, this guy potentially could be a violent person. And up in the early 70s, there was no violence that we knew of. It was all ransacking, property damage, property stealing, peeping, you know, that whole uh, prowling thing. 
But we saw the way that the, some of the sexual overtones of the method of operation began to really make us wonder what was going on here and what the potential was for this character. And so for, you know, for two or three years, uh, he would go in and he would do his, his thing. And sometimes there was a bicycle connected to it, like he rode in on a bicycle and put it against a door or a wall. Uh, and a stolen bicycle would be reported. And so all, we were starting to try and connect all these things. And we had an anti-burglary team at the time. And we got a federal grant to create this anti-burglary team. And they, of course, were the ones focusing on this pattern of burglars and trying to connect the, the uh, prowling as well. Um, another thing he'd do in the residence, I almost forgot this, was, was kind of weird too, was he'd, stay, he'd take blue chip stamps. I mean, rarely do you have a burglar who's targeting blue chip stamps. I mean, they might have been valuable at the time, but there was no quick market to sell blue chip stamp books. So again, it, it kind of set this person aside as somebody that was really uh, somebody that needed to be watched, but was out of the ordinary. Uh, always wore a ski mask when he was observed, and he could, would be observed periodically lurking in the darkness around homes. And people would just say, that's a prowler, or that's a guy who lives down the street, or coming up with all sorts of reasons why it wasn't a concern. Um, he would hit areas where there was either a, a ditch dry ditch behind the property or alongside the property, excuse me, or a, or a path that cut through a residential neighborhood. But we, we found eventually we connected um, some of the pattern is that he would use those dry ditches and those pathway, pathways as a way to get in and out without having anybody really spot him. He could ride his bike down there too, and you know, it was always at night, always in the cover of darkness. Um, so, this is what was going on for about two years in Visalia, and we were focused in on it, but more and more we became concerned of the unusual nature of the crimes was not your typical property crime person. It tended to point to a potential crime against a person because of the, some of the sexual overtones and some of the things that were done inside the residence. <clears throat> so in 19, the thing sort of brought, came to a head really in, um, I'll give you the exact date, it was uh, September the 9th, or September the 11th, 1975. And that day, that evening actually, um, at the home of Claude Snelling, who happened to be a COS teacher, teacher in the journalism department, 45 year old man was at home with his family and his daughter living in their home not too far from the COS campus. And around 2 a.m., a masked man came into that house, grabbed the 16-year-old daughter, and began escorting her out the back door of the residence. Dad was alerted, Claude Snelling was alerted, went to the back door and said, hey, that's my daughter, words to that effect. And all at once, he pushed the girl to the ground as he's heading over the back fence and shot Claude Snelling from, uh, as he was standing in the doorway of the back door. And that was on, on September the 11th, 1975. And all at once, he became connected to this string of burglaries, prowlings, 
and the conclusion was that in fact he was progressively getting more bold and moving more toward harming individuals rather than just stealing property. So, uh, she was saved. Her dad died in the process of saving her. Uh, that was big news. For those of you that uh, lived in anywhere in Tulare County at the time, that would have been big news. Uh, a, a father protecting his, his daughter was shot and killed by this kidnapper. So all at once we moved from anti-burglary team investigating a series of strange burglaries, we created a Visalia ransacker investigative team. It started right after the Claude Snelling shooting because we realized this is escalating. He has now got to the point where, where people are losing their lives because of his actions. And if you talk to psychologists that look into uh, these types of strange MOs on burglaries, it's not unusual that there's this escalation to do various things. So once you see that pattern, stand by, because you're going to have it move to the next level, which oftentimes is kidnapping, rapes, and that type of thing. So uh, that's when this Visalia Ransacker investigative team uh, was formed. That team, chief of police was Raymond W. Forsyth at the time, and said we need to have somebody leading this team that we can uh, that go and, and do what absolutely needs to be done to try and identify this man and capture this man. And so he picked Sergeant John Vaughn, just made sergeant, was in charge of the newly created traffic bureau, motorcycle cops. But John had been with the department uh, since 1966 and had come to us uh, at VPD from Porterville PD and had three years of experience there. So he's a, he's a trained veteran officer by the time he was handpicked to lead this investigative team. And the chief told him, pick two other investigators, people that you think can, can really add to this team. And so we picked uh, another veteran officer named Dwayne Shipley, uh, and picked uh, another officer named William or Bill McGowan. The McGowan family was a Tulare family. Still maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, but that became the three-person Visalia Ransacker special team. And for the next eight months, they just worked night and day trying to identify who this guy was. Keep in mind that the 70s were pre-DNA days. You know, if you collect DNA now, you can run it through a database and there's a decent chance that the person that you have the DNA on has probably had their sample on file. Uh, in those days, there was no, no such thing. Um, so you collected evidence, you did fingerprints when you could get them. But we knew early on that this guy was paying attention to detail. I mean, he was planning his exit when he'd do these crimes. And he would do all the things, I mean, he would, he would put things in a position where if somebody would come to the door, they'd create a racket and give him an early warning that somebody was coming. He was doing things beyond your ordinary burglar. And so they knew this guy had some, either, we figured early on, he was either a military guy with military experience or was a, uh, was a police officer or somebody that knew tactical things, that knew how to plan these things. So that was their focus. Their focus was on who in the community has had mil recent military experience, uh, cops, you, how do you investigate which cop it could be? You need more than that. 
but they were paying attention to somebody who was trained in tactics and in um, staying away from being caught. And so they ended up going to uh, the young girl that was kidnapped. Uh, yeah, actually, she was kidnapped because she was taken from the house to the back fence. And so in, in criminal law, kidnapping is if I take you and I take you from you or there to there, kidnapping is complete. You don't have to go miles. You don't have to go whatever. You can go any distance and kidnapping is complete. And so he was at that point not only wanted for homicide or murder, but for kidnapping. So the girl was, uh, the daughter was, was questioned about the uh, physical appearance of the guy that kidnapped her. And there were some composite artists that uh, took her description and created what they thought was a likeness based on what she said. So they plastered these composites in the newspaper and said, look, if this person looks familiar to you, tell us so we can at least rule them in or rule them out. My gosh, the calls came in. I mean, people were turning in their dads, their moms, their <laughs> brothers. <laughs> I mean, composites aren't really that specific usually. So there is a wide range of possible uh, matches here. Uh, but I have a feeling people were trying to get rid of dad sometimes. <laughs> and they this might be a good way to do that. But we got calls and said, hey, look at so-and-so, look at so-and-so. So the special team was going out and interviewing all these people saying, uh, where were you on such and such a night? And they go, what are you talking about? But I'm the minister at the church. <laughs> Doesn't matter, where were you? And so they... I mean, they had hundred, hundred of peop hundreds of people uh, came coming in as suspect. And I mean, you can kind of imagine everybody is sort of paranoid. Like, oh my gosh, are they going to turn me in? I mean, I saw somebody there that I thought, man, that could be so-and-so. Well, I knew it wasn't, but based on the composite, it could have easily been. So they were running down all these leads and people that couldn't, couldn't provide good alibis became, you know, stayed on the suspect list and so on until they could get removed from the list. But they were doing all sorts of things. They, they took um, different people to hypnotists who would have seen somebody that could have been the ransacker. And there's some interesting results from some of those hypnotism sessions. And John Vaughn, uh, who's the only member, by the way, who's left on that special investigative team. The other two members have passed on. But John remembers, he sat in on those hypnotism sessions. And on April the 6th, which I'll talk about more at the end here, He's going to share with us the inside investigative techniques and things that that team did in order to identify the suspect. And just as an aside, I can remember as a, as a uniform officer sitting out in the, in the briefing room and having Sergeant Vaughn, who was I mean, bigger than life for me, I had been a two, cop for two years, so I mean, here, here he was. Sergeant's a big guy anyway. And he says, look, this is what we want you to look for. And so we were frantically taking notes and we'd say, what about this? And he'd say, you don't need to know that. Next question. And he was telling cops this. Well, the whole idea is that you have a right to know, but do you need to know that? And if you're an investigator, you want to keep information as close to the vest as you possibly can. And that includes some of the officers that don't really need to know that. Because if they go home and tell their spouse, and the spouse tells the cousin, who now tells the whole church congregation, all at once these little minutia pieces of the investigation are no longer your secret. They're out in the world. And people that... Uh, um, 
people that want to. It's it's always been hard for me to understand people that said, "Look, okay, I did it," and they weren't even in the country, <laughs> but they get some thrill out of claiming that they did the crime. And I, for the whatever, I cannot even understand it. It's got to be some big psychological stuff. But if they know minutia detail, it's harder to rule them out because they know the detail that you should have kept secret. So that's why they don't. So here I was sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, you know, we got a big job to do out here and they won't tell us some of the, the detail. Well, they did that for a, for a reason. You know, during World War II, what was the old expression? Loose lips sink ships. Same idea, same idea. And so it took me maybe two or three minutes to realize that was a smart thing to tell us none of your business. We didn't need to know it, but there were certain things that beat cops needed to know, and that, that's the things he shared with us. So the session, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead, the session on August or April the 6th, John is going to spill his guts. <laughs> And John is 80 years old, but he's got a memory like an elephant. And he lived and breathed that case for eight months plus. And he gave me some teasers, and there's going to be some interesting things that he's going to reveal on August, on, why do I say August? April the 6th. And I might as well, I'm getting into it already, so let me, let me just hand these out. It's a free event. I don't know if I have enough. But all the details should be on there. If it's not, let me know. But he's going to sit up on stage at COS in the Ponderosa Room Lecture Hall. And he is going to tell us what went on inside that, that ransacker special investigative team. And uh, that's going to be a big deal. It's going to be a big deal for me because he has not shared a lot of the things that he is going to tell us, uh, even with me in advance. So um, anyway, that's what's coming up. John Vaughn is a big deal. He's 80. He's sharp as a tack. And when he, I retired in 1997. He retired in 1996, and he uh, told me when he retired, he said that was his biggest regret, is that he wasn't able to uh, come up with an identification on the ransack. And the interesting story, and he'll talk about this too, and in, uh, that team stayed together for eight months, and then they finally ran out of leads uh, to pursue. So, it became a cold case at that point. I mean, it was still open, but it was a cold case in that there were no new leads to pursue. And so they, they disbanded the unit, and we were all on the alert. But so for some reason, after the Snelling homicide, the burglary stopped, the prowling seemed to stop. And no one could quite figure it out, but we all kind of figured, you know what, the guy stopped doing this, and if he doesn't do anything again, he is going to escape being convicted or being arrested for this offense. And that was not a pleasant thought for us. And as the years went on, we all began to wonder if this guy was ever going to be identified. Maybe he was already dead. We didn't know. Maybe he was in prison and we just didn't know who it was. But we were all concerned. All of us that worked that case in any small or big way kind of expected this to go nowhere. We were never going to find out who this guy was. But a funny little story in 18 or 19, uh, 1977. Snelling was killed in 75. 
the team disbanded in late 76, but in 77, the team sort of resurrected itself and went up to Sacramento because they were noticing that Sacramento was having a rash of crimes, similar type crimes, more violent, but similar. And they went up there and they brought the MO of our ransacker to that, that investigative unit at Sacramento County. And they said, we said to them, I think you need to look at the Visalia ransacker as being your East Area Rapist. And that's what they were calling their guy up there, East Area Rapist. And they looked at our investigative team and said, where are you guys from? Tulare County? Honey, what do you know about this? You guys aren't real cops. From Poda, I said, yeah, come on. So they said, look, look at the MO factors, compare them with yours. And they said, we'll do that, but hey, thanks for coming up anyway, and uh, we'll talk to you later. And they basically poo pooed our investigator. And guess what? When Joseph James D'Angelo was arrested, and of course much earlier than that, but he was, it was pretty much, it was totally confirmed that our Visalia ransacker was the East Area Rapist up there. And, and the same was going on in different parts of California. In fact, he was, um, he was called the East Area Rapist. Uh, let's see, what are some of the other titles? Uh, original Night Stalker. Because he was doing some crimes, I think, in the Bay Area as well. And ultimately, he was called the Golden State Killer, and that's what we know him as today. When you see the headlines in the newspaper when D'Angelo was arrested in 2018, and he finally admitted and confessed he was known everywhere as California as the Golden State Killer. Well, just think about that. The Golden State Killer had his start in my son. That's pretty historic. Now it's nothing to be proud of, and I'm not hanging, you know, Tulare County on a flag and waving and saying we're great. No, that's bad, but it's our history. And had I not wrote my book, Wild Tulare County, 10 years ago, D'Angelo would have been in my Wild Tulare County book because he was that nasty and that bad. But it, that's just the way it is. But anyway, we were, we were found to be correct when we linked him to their crime guy, their East Area Rapist. And so they ended up, uh, in a sense, apologizing for basically calling us a bunch of country bumpkins, because in fact it was the same. And when D'Angelo was arrested uh, in 18 and, and pled guilty in, I think it was 20, uh, yeah, he sentenced in 20, arrested in 18. Uh, he pled guilty to 13 murders, 13 kidnapping cases. Now, we know he did more than that. We know his crime spree was much larger than that. He just decided those were the ones he was going to take the heat for, and he pled guilty in exchange for taking the death penalty off the table. So, his, his case was not going to be prosecuted as a death penalty case and because of the, the plea bargain that was uh, created to get him to plead guilty. So 13 murders, 13 kidnapped. Um, he's now sitting in Corcoran State Prison. Um, for this program on the 6th, uh, I wanted in the worst way to get D'Angelo on film talking about Visalia and Tulare County and, and of course I 
you probably knew this already, I didn't even have to mention it, but for three years, D'Angelo was a police officer in the city of Exeter. So, I mean, he was both a cop, at the same time he was doing police work, he was committing all these crimes, which is unbelievable to me, to take all this police training and use it in such a nasty way. But he, he did. And so when I, when I uh, wanted to get him on film, I contacted different groups and different organizations to try and get a, an insight to how to do that and to get a positive response from D'Angelo. And of course, they're treating him like precious silver. Uh, got him hunkered down so that uh, nothing bad happens to him, and I understand that. So I said, how can I get to talk to this guy? He said, unless you want, he wants to talk to you, you're not going to talk to him. I said, well, how can I find out if he would talk to me? And they said, well, that's a good question. Uh, you can do an email. Do an email, and we'll get the email to him. And I said, OK. Does he have an email address? They said, no. <laughs> but he's got a prison number, and he's got this, what they call a JPay process at the state prison system. That's a, an outsourcing internet provider to the inmate. So I had to buy minutes, I think it was, of time that this request would take. And so finally, I gave them the money they wanted. And I said, How, let's get this moving. And I created an email. And this is what my email said. I didn't want to tell him really what I thought of him. That was not going to get me where I wanted to be. Uh, well, I lied to you. I didn't bring that. Darn. It wasn't any big deal. I can, I can paraphrase it. Dear Mr. D'Angelo, uh, I would really like an opportunity to talk to you because I live in Tulare County as well as you did for many years. And like you, I was a police officer in Tulare County. And I would just like a chance to chat with you about things of mutual interest. <laughs> And I didn't say U-S-O-B, I didn't do anything. I, I, was, I was strictly sort of professional, I guess you could say. And I never heard back. Tick me off. I wanted so badly to be able to get a video of him talking about his capers in Tulare County and giving having that come off of his lips for posterity. So can you imagine having that for a historian 50 years from now on the biggest serial murder case in California who started his career in Visalia, and he says Visalia to Larry County on a video. I mean, that would be good. Excuse me, that would be good stuff. But I couldn't get it. But I tried. I had to try. And the, the state prison system is so tough to deal with. I don't know how you ever get in. Some of these interviews you see on TV where they're talking to inmates, I can't even imagine the rigmarole and the, and the red tape that you have to go through to get that to happen. Uh, but anyway, I had to try. And uh, what you have. And how am I doing on time? Dan, where's Dan? By the way, this man's a great communicator. <laughs> you really are good, lucked out with having somebody like him. But I seriously mean that. Dan, how are we doing on time? 7 o'clock. 10 minutes. Okay, that's perfect. Um, so you've got the brochure thing. And I think I've already said this, but what you're going to hear if you come to this program, and, and I... I strongly encourage you to do. Uh, this is very historic in its own right to having the lead investigator in person 
talking about inside that investigation. That's historic in its own right. It is going to be simulcast. Uh, it's going to be preserved uh, as best you can preserve a stage presentation, sort of like you're doing here. Uh, because I think for posterity, that needs to happen too. For those of us going to be there, it's, it's, it's going to be a special treat. But for historians 50 years from now that are going to do some kind of analysis on what was going on in Tulare County during the mid-70s crime-wise, I mean, this is going to be a very valuable uh, uh, taped interview uh, for them to, to, uh, to refer back to. So that's going to be, that's going to be a big deal. And, when I talked to Brent Calvin way back when I was first scheduling this, I, Brent's the president of COF, and I was kind of hand, uh, hat in hand, I said, Brent, I'm looking for a venue to put on this program, this John Bond program, and I went into explaining it. And I said, you know, I'd sure like to find a venue. He said, you already found it. I'm done. I'm here. I'm, this, is, this is what COS is all about. He's providing it for free. He's doing the simulcast for free. He's doing refreshments for free. Everything for free. I couldn't ask for, for a better host than the president of COS. He says, look, look Claude Snelling was a teacher here. How could we not want to do this? You see the word community college? We are part of the community. And so I said, I'm done. You convinced me we're doing it right here. And so that's, that's where it's going to be. It's going to be in the Ponderosa room, right behind the little theater. You know, if you've ever been to the COS theater, there's a parking lot just to the north. Park in the same parking lot. And instead of going into the theater, you go one building uh, inside campus, and that's the big Ponderosa lecture hall. It holds 240 people. I can almost guarantee it's going to be standing room only. Free, free parking, no reserved seats, first come, first serve. So I've been hearing from people left and right today, especially because I've been putting the word out. Um, and they said, can you reserve a seat for us? No. Once I start doing that, the only person that's going to get a reserved seat is Gail Vaughn, the spouse of John. She's going to get one right up in front. She deserves that. And his son as well, who lives in my side. And uh, Good Life Magazine, which is this little thing right here, which is in a lot of the different medical facilities in different places, it's got a, a big article about the program. Larry uh, Cast, who owns the newspaper, uh, actually did an interview with John Vaughn and includes some of that in the article on here. Uh, so that's the latest issue, so you can pick up more there. Or you can go to my website. And I do have a website, thanks to my daughter. Uh, I begged and begged and begged for years, and nothing happened. And finally, she said, Dad, I'm going to do your website. So she did a website for Christmas, this last Christmas. And so www.kaweadrifter.com, and that's me. <laughs> and uh, the event is also on there. Um, so I'm open to questions that you might have. Uh, and I'd be really curious, how many of you remember any kind of talk at all? I'm not talking about Tim Ward's talk. Talking about just thinking back, the Visaya Ransacker, does that come to anybody's mind? Anybody remember that? Yeah, and it, it's amazing to me, and I was a cop at the time, so I wasn't really, I mean, I, I knew it was a big deal, but I wasn't really terrorized by it, but a lot of people were. I still get people today talking, giving me a ransacker story. That they remembered that there was a guy who was on a bicycle by their window one time, and 
everybody's got a ransacker story. And there's going to be an open mic, too, by the way, at the event, so that people that have questions, maybe a comment or two, can make them. Uh, it's going to be a big deal. It's going to be historically so important. And it's hard to, for me, being a history buff like I am, I mean, I think back to if somebody, one of the lawmen in the 1890s who was chasing Chris Evans would have sat down and recorded what was going on during that manhunt, can you imagine having access to that now and thinking, whoa, have I got some inside information? We're going to have that now with the biggest serial killing incident in California. The Golden State Killer started right here. And again, not to be proud of, but it's our history. Take it or leave. Yes, ma'am. Have you tried talking to any of the guards at Corcoran? Isn't he still at Corcoran? He is. Would the guards? Guards wouldn't. I didn't talk. I talked to the PIO, Public Information Officer at Corcoran. He's the one that ultimately gave me the the steps to follow. And I said, how do I know that? I, I didn't want to be rude. I said, how do I know that the email I send is actually going to get to the end? They might have said, I don't know. I know I didn't get a response. My cross street neighbor is a guard there, and I thought maybe I'd like for But I mean, I can't imagine a guard taking it on taking it on their own and slipping a note to stand. <laughs> oh, I think that might be an easy way to get fired. <laughs> yes, ma'am. When did he move from Exeter? He was there from 73 to 76. So and it just so happened to coincide with the uh, stopping of the, of the burglaries in Visalia. So did it stop? No more burglaries or incidents after the snowing? That's pretty much it. Now, I can't say specifically whether none happened, but virtually none have. All of those dots, his leaving Exeter, the stopping of the burglaries, the snowing homicide, all was right in line. When the and then their, their crimes in Sacramento started, Right after that. I mean, it's... When the officer was shot in the Visalia, shot in the hand, I think it was. Yeah, September of before, 75. Was that before Plot Snow? Excuse me. Dece no, it was three months after, December of 75. Yeah, he was on stakeout um, and was sitting in a garage in an area that the ransacker was hitting. And he saw movement, and of course this is after dark, he saw movement and he thought, oh my gosh, is that the owner walking their dog? They told him, don't come out, but still, in darkness, do you think that's the prowler or that's the homeowner? You know, you go, oh my god. Or was it his partner, because they were both set up in the same general area. So he hesitated. And he confronted the, the guy, yelled at the guy, and the guy squealed in a high-pitched squeal, turned and fired. And McGowan, Bill McGowan, the officer that was on stakeout, was always, you're always trained in law enforcement to hold your flashlight out from you when you're shining it, because any shooter will shoot the aim for the light. So they aim for the, he aimed for the light, which is another thing that that um, D'Angelo knew is he hit the flashlight and the bullet fragments, shrapnel basically went into Bill McGowan's eyes. Let's do a real quick, Dan, can we do the real quick thing on the photos? And these are in no real order, but I'll kind of give you a short little deal if you just go one right after the other. There's only 16, so it won't take you long. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that's John Vaughn's retirement badge. He retired as a sergeant, not living in Tulare County right now. 
Next one, please. So I'm going to get a, a bigger one here that we that'll be a little easier to see. Oh. Oh. Maybe Whoa. Not. That's not <laughs> maybe not. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, that's probably okay. Okay. This is uh, when D'Angelo was in Exeter PD. This would have been taken probably. I think this was taken basically when he was signed on. So this would have been 1973. After uh, we found out who it was in our, has anybody ever come forward? I, I worked with him. You, you know. did? No, 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 no. Oh. At, like from Exeter or whatever, a policeman that would say, you know, I was not even kind of. Not to me, to they have. But in fact, okay. I've heard stories that they say, Joseph D'Angelo, who? So I think there might be amnesia uh -huh. creeping in with some. I mean, who wants to claim this guy, right? Yeah. And that, that's him in the rest shop right there when he was arrested in 18. That's when Visalia, see the Sacramento Union newspaper, rapist Visalia cases tied. They resisted that and finally had to admit it was correct. They were the same. That's how the Sacramento Union is famous. And there's one, there's a composite with two different versions of that. But you can, you probably know somebody that looks like that, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the nature of composites. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, a little different side view there, I think. Next one. That's Bill McGowan shot with his uh, shrapnel in his eye from the flashlight. Uh, that's the article that, um, that announced Bill, uh, Bill McGowan's hit by the, uh, by the ransacker. Ransacking fits, yeah, okay, there, you no, know, ransacking fits familiar pattern. I mean, pattern with, it, with him was critical because that is exactly how we were able to identify from the reports now. Keep in mind, many, many crimes are not reported. And I suspect there were a lot of ransacker crimes that were never reported because people say, hey, what are the cops going to do? He just threw a bunch of stuff on the floor. Just pick it up and let's go on with our lives. So there's probably more burglars, <clears throat> some of which unreported. Next one, please. Uh, Dwayne Shipley's middle. He was part of the investigative team. Um, Bill Whippen, sheriff. You see, you see Bill on the lower left there. He was a sergeant with the department at the time. Next one. Uh, uh, John Vaughn, upper left. To his right, as we face it, is Bill McGowan. Next. There's John in retirement. He looks pretty close to that today. He got a little older. That, of course, is the newspaper article when uh, Claude Snelling was killed. Next. This is some of the paths that we found he used when he went into residential neighborhoods because it was, at night it's so dark. He could sneak in, sneak out, trees, shrubs to hide in. You know, next one, please. That's about the size of the department in 1974, 75, 63 sworn officers, uh, 20 non-sworn. So it was a department of about 83. It's probably double that now. Next one. And that's just the patch. I think that might be the last one. That is the last one. OK, any final questions before I let you go? Lorraine. And fingerprints, was he careful never to leave any fingerprints or did fingerprints ever come into play? No, no. Very, very few fingerprints. We think he was we think he had gloves and had a way he knew. I mean he's a cop. Trained, he's not gonna leave fingerprints, which was really the only way of identification in the seventies. And if he didn't leave a fingerprint, he's safe. Because if he had left a fingerprint, we could have searched him because his fingerprints would have been on file because he was an officer. And he knew that too. You know. So yeah. yes, were there any other burglaries besides in my seven? We don't know. I suspect there was. Uh, I don't know that. But I, I just can't believe I think there were other homicides in Tulare County that he committed. 
but he never admitted to him and we couldn't pin him on him. So, you know, he walks and he basically admitted to 13 homicides in the state, one of which was Clubstone. That's the only Tulare County murder he confessed to. Has he met, I mean, talking about him confessing to those, has he made any other type of statements like, when he kidnapped Beth and killed her dad. I mean, does he talk about, has he ever talked about any of that since he's been arrested and all this well, going see, on? Well, see, that was, see, he's, he was arrested in 2018, and he had committed crimes everywhere. This was such ancient history to him. He might remember the incident, but I don't think he ever gave any, he, he at, when the victims gave their impact <coughs> statements, when he was sentenced, I think he apologized, but I think he had some inner person that was really responsible for these, like his alt alternative personality really made him do it. And so, so he really didn't take responsibility, except he did apologize for the pain that he caused. And as far as the escalation that you talked about, um, I mean, was that just at that point in time, just a, a progression that, that that was about when it would happen when he when he killed Beth's dad like that? That, or I mean, he just panicked and killed him, or he really was that was going to happen? No, no, he. This is a first known case right. of kidnapping of a 16-year-old in the middle of the night out of their own house. Mm -hmm. That is a serious escalation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, there's there's burglary, and then there's kidnapping a 16-year-old girl in the middle of the night. He was working his way, activity-wise, up to that point. And then that's why it continued when he went up into the Sacramento area. I mean, he raped and pillaged and burned up there an awful lot, and that was... That's the fascination with me, is that his beginning was really in myself. Which, you know, it's a sad state of affairs, but it's our history and, you know, we can't sanitize it. It was the way it was, and that's, that's, you know. Any other questions? Mine's more of a, of a comment. Um, my parents' house is, uh, I think, the yard that he crossed. See, a ransacker story. <laughs> and everywhere. Then he crossed through after the, the smelling the fence that he jumped. Mm -hmm. My parents, um, growing up, um, would tell us about that. And as kids, we were like, that doesn't play cool. Well, this sounds made up. And there was a gentleman, when he would randomly show up on our cul-de-sac on a bicycle, is this before this now? But like before 2018. No, but I mean, we're talking. Yeah, this is probably late 90s. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, he would park his bike on the corner of the house across the street and just stare at my parents' house. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so for the longest time, my parents thought that that was him. Like, that was the guy coming back to look. But now that they have seen what he actually looks like, just a separate weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, you will not hear from me or anybody on the on the stage on uh, April 6th mention that address, the, the Claude Snelling address. They don't obviously live there anymore, but I don't want to create misery on anybody's part. And you know, I feel a little badly because of Elizabeth, the daughter, who still lives in Visalia, uh, doing this. I, I mean, she loved her dad, obviously, and if you listen to her impact statement, uh, you can still see it on YouTube, by the way, if you look up uh, Ransacker impact, victim impact statements, and that, that really tugs at you. And, I made some inroads to try and talk to her, and I didn't go direct. I used some intermediaries that were mutual acquaintances of her, and, and I never heard back from her. So I feel a little bad that a 
resurrecting something that involves her dad and her her life, but at the same time, you know, she doesn't have to come. And you know, uh, I'm not going to give her address. I'm not even going to mention her name. And so, you know, I'd love to have her there. I mean, can you imagine the value of having her go into the detail of that kidnapping? I mean, from a history point of view, take take the emotion out of it. From a history point of view, to have her to climb inside her head and, and talk about that 16-year-old kidnap victim, that'd be powerful stuff. But the emotion would have to be very, very tough. And I don't I don't really have an interest in doing that to her. She suffered enough. I mean, when you think about you know, the dad killed, killed trying to save you. Did he ever get married and have a family? I think he did. I think he did. I don't think he was married at the time of the arrest. I think somebody said, didn't he, doesn't he still have family or something? I thought I heard that. I've not pursued that. This has got to be terrible for them, too. There's a, there's a lot of pain and heartache to go around here. Believe he had me. Two daughters, and I think his his ex-wife was a divorce lawyer in the Sacramento area. And I think one of his daughters was living with him at the time he was arrested. Oh my gosh. Huh? And he did he left Exeter PD to work for another PD up in Sacramento. And I forget the suburb of Sacramento, but I'm, I think I read where he was while he was working there as a police officer, he got arrested for shoplifting. <laughs> and then, of course, his police career ended. But uh, and then after that, I don't know what he did for, for work. But and if it wasn't for that forensic genealogy, green <laughs> genealogy, <laughs> forensic genealogy, you did, uh, is that what? Um, Tim Ward talked about? Yeah. 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 yeah, see that's what you talk about getting a boost for your for your line of work on huh? genealogy. You guys got a got a red star for that one. But that's a big deal. Big deal. You can watch all the true crime shows on TV now. Half of them are solved by through ge uh, forensic genealogy. That's something we didn't have. That, do we have time for one more? Mm -hmm. Do you know how many of the victims he called after the fact? I'm sorry? I had read online that he would call his victims. Do you know how many he had called? I don't know. That wouldn't have been here. That would have been up someplace other than here. He, if you, if you uh, and of course, I mean, you could, you could spend the next five years reading about the Golden State Killer. And I just have two books, one called By Celia Ransacker, and the other is I'll Be Gone in the Dark. But there's probably 25 other books, hundreds of articles, podcasts, all about the Golden State Killer. So, I mean, you can, you can put yourself to sleep, maybe, reading all of them. <laughs> did, did the police ever do a profile and then when he was caught, they connect the, you know, see how close it was to that profile? I don't know. That's a good question for John because when I talked to John after the arrest, and I, I couldn't help it, I had to call him out because I had to know what he was feeling. And of course, he's, he's going to tell us that uh, on uh, April the 6th as well. He might have done something. I don't know. He's got a binder on the ransacker this thick at his home, and uh, he's bumming up because I told him I'm going to get nasty and deep and dirty with you, so be ready. And he said, okay, I'll be ready. I said, I want all the secrets out on the table. So he promised he'd do that. You going to write a book afterward? Is he? Are you? Oh, gosh. I got so many topics in the, <laughs> in the line before that, I'd never get to that. 
It'd be a great topic. Oh my gosh, a, a wonderful topic. It should have been the last slide here or email. I'm not going to write a book. <laughs> I will not say that, but I'll say this. I don't think I will ever write a book about it. Yeah, so anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Did you have one more question? Is he in solitary confinement? I'm sorry? Is he in solitary confinement? I don't know. Would he be telling other inmates his story, the garbage, and uh, you could talk to the other inmates? I don't know a lot about advantage. correctional facilities, but I do know if a prisoner is a potential target by other inmates. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I think he's he probably a target. He he's was a former a cop. former cop, yeah. number one. And plus the nastiness of some of his crimes. And they really are nasty crimes. And if you haven't read them, you may not want to, but if you really want to get inside this guy's head and find out how dirty and nasty he was, you, you look at some of the experiences that he put his victims through. I mean, this guy, whew, I, it, and I'm so embarrassed that he took his police training. Okay. Thank you, folks. Thank Appreciate you. it.